Thank you very much for that introduction, Sam, and uh, and thanks also for the invitation to be here. Uh, it's been a, a, a really uh, fun and exciting three days, lots of uh, interesting sessions and lots of discussions and debates. Um, and uh, yeah, so congratulations on, on putting on a great event. And and thanks to all of you for, for being here. I mean, my title is uh, It's All in Your Head, Brain Training, <laughs> Neuroscience, and the Limits of Endurance. And it's I, I guess, as Sam said, it's an appropriate topic for a Friday afternoon on the final day of a conference. We'll, test the limits of our endurance here uh, with one more talk. But this topic is one that I've been kind of drawn to as a science journalist for the last five or six years, partly because it's just there's a lot of interesting research coming out. It's a very lively area, and as, as some of the discussions over the last few days have shown, it's also a very controversial area. So that's, that's fun for me as a science journalist. Um, but it's also a, a personal interest as, as someone who participated in endurance sport I guess I'm still kind of chasing that very fundamental question of, you know, why wasn't I faster? Why, why couldn't I go just a little bit faster? And, the, and I think the, the more time you spend chasing your limits, the, the, the more you come back to the conclusion that, that the brain plays a big role, but that we have a really hard time putting our finger on exactly how or exactly why that happens. So um, yeah, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over some research in this area. Uh, some of it is, I'll be going over stuff that has been brought up in sessions over the last few days. Uh, hopefully, I'll bring a slightly different perspective to it as, as someone who's an observer of the field rather than a, rather than a participant. So to start, I'll, I'll show, um, I'll go back to a study that, that Sam mentioned this morning, uh, Money versus Pain, Experimental Study of a, a Conflict in Humans, which uh, Michel Cabanac published almost 30 years ago. And the, 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 the design of this study was very simple. It was just you, you, you sit against the wall with no chair as for as long as you can until you collapse. And to make it interesting, uh, Kamenak offered a, a certain amount of money for every additional 20 seconds the subject could stay standing up, and he ran the experiment over and over again with, with different amounts of, uh, of money being offered. Now, this is a sophisticated audience. If, if you ask, if you, if you go to a typical group of runners, say, and say, when this person collapses from the wall, why is it that they collapse? Then you'll, you'll get answers to do with, you know, people will talk about muscle fibers or, you know, accumulation of things like lactate in, in their muscles. That there's some physical limit. You, you stay as long as you can, and eventually you're unable to sustain this, this isometric contraction. Um, but of course, when you, the results still aren't a surprise. I, they're pretty much what we would all expect. The, the more money you offer, the longer people stay up against the wall. And in fact, you, you pretty much double the time that people, that double the, the limit that they encounter uh, with a relatively modest uh, change in the amount of money you offer. This is sort of the equivalent of a, a dollar or two per, per 20 seconds at most. Um, and if you look at this curve, it's actually, uh, if you fit a curve to it, it looks like a logarithm, which kind of implies that it's going to keep increasing indefinitely, because logarithms never actually reach a, a horizontal asymptote. So there's, there's this sort of sen sense that, oh, we, actually, we don't have any limits then, which doesn't really agree with our uh, intuition or notions of common sense. We, we, we would expect that at a certain point, you're going to reach some sort of saturation where if you offer me $10 million or $11 million, it's not going to make any difference to, to, uh, to how long I can stay against the wall. And, and I think we, we tend to assume that if we're talking about competitive sport, certainly high level competitive endurance sport, we're operating in this, this saturation regime where the line is flat. You're, you're, you're dealing with, with, with limits, as, as Andy Jones was saying, was suggesting earlier, rather than just sort of at a lack of desire when you finish second in the Olympics because you didn't really want it enough. That, that, that doesn't seem to make sense. But on the other hand, you know, I, so I had, to, I had a training partner for many years who was very eccentric and had a lot of theories about uh, how running works. And he, he would tell me that whenever he got to the moment of truth in a race, whenever he got to a critical moment where, for instance, someone was going to pull away from him and he had to decide whether he could keep going, he would, he would ask himself, you know, what would happen if a lion jumped out from behind that tree over there and started chasing me? Could I, could I go faster? And he said in, in his, you know, 10 years of running, he never answered that question with no. There's always, he was always capable of going faster, which is really just another way of saying that even when we are dealing with limits that, that we perceive as sort of immutable, that in his opinion at least, that they're, they're, they're moderated by the brain, they're medi or mediated by the brain. And so that's the kind of question I want to explore today, which is, first of all, does the brain influence what we perceive to be physical limits? And if so, can, can we manipulate them, to, uh, presumably, to our benefit? So to do that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about five different lines of evidence, um, and, uh, you know, and some of which we've, we've heard a little bit about uh, earlier today. Um, 
some of these different bodies of research complement each other or, or, or even overlap a little bit. Others contradict each other. I'm not going to be the referee today. I, I don't know what the final answers are, but I think all of these areas of research or, or lines of research offer some interesting insights or point us in, in some interesting directions to, to, to think about. So I'm going to start with the central governor, which is probably the, if you talk about the brain and endurance performance, this is the idea that has penetrated the public consciousness the, the most that people have heard of. Uh, and it's most associated with Tim Noakes of the University of Cape Town, although certainly many others have, have made contributions to, to the ideas as they've uh, evolved. Um, and I, I think the, the, the crux of what Tim would say is that exercise performance is not limited by organ or muscle failure. So w whether you're talking about uh, sitting against the wall until you collapse or whether you're talking about making a, uh, running a race as, as hard as you can, you don't reach a point where um, you know, your muscle is simply unable to contract any further. Um, instead, he would say it's, the performance is regulated in anticipation by the brain to avoid failure. So there may be such a thing as, as absolute physical limits or failure, but you never reach them because your brain is fundamentally cautious and is somehow holding you back so that you keep something in reserve and, and never quite reach that point. And so, so on what basis would, would, uh, would he make this argument? Well, there's a, there's a lot of observations that, that you can make. Uh, we've There have been uh, several sessions on pacing over the last few days, and it's obviously an extremely complicated topic, and there's, there's lots of debate to be had. But a pretty basic observation is that if you look at world records in, in endurance events, for instance, these are this is the average pace, uh, pace splits of every world record set in, uh, men's world record in the 5,000 and 10,000 set in the modern era. So, so for the last century or so, that's 64 records, and in 63 of those records, the first or last kilometer was, was faster than any other kilometer in the race. The only exception was Paul Turgat's 1997 10,000-meter uh, record, where the ninth kilometer was fractionally faster than the tenth kilometer. And we can explain these sort of pacing patterns in a lot of different ways, by, by you know, the shift from different one en energy system to another, or just by decision-making, fundamentally cautious pacemaking. You don't want to keel over before you reach the finish line, so you hold a little bit back. But it's, it, I, that, that kind of explanation, I think, is hard for, to justify from, from my perspective, because these are the best runners <coughs> in history on the best days of their lives. So there's not, it's not an accident that there's this consistent ability to speed up at the end. Um, it, it suggests that uh, even when you're going as hard as you can, there, on, on a day when you optimally execute the best strategy that, that's available to you, you hold something in reserve, and at the moment when you're, where your body is most tired, you, you are nonetheless able to speed up, suggesting you have something in reserve. There are other lines of evidence, like uh, this, the, this body of research on sports, uh, rinsing and spitting sports drink out. So, um, you know, your, your muscles can store enough carbohydrate for, you know, let's say 90 to 120 minutes. Um, but strangely enough, sports drink seems to help performance even in shorter bouts of, uh, of exercise. Um, and that's sort of like if, if you're driving your car and when the, the petrol tank gets down to half full, it starts to slow down. Um, that's not how your car works, but, and it's not clear why your, your body should work that way. But there's been this, this uh, in the last maybe 10 years, nine years, there's been research showing that if you switch, switch a sports drink around in your mouth and then spit it out, uh, you'll have a performance enhancement. So, and, and brain scanning studies show that uh, when you have this carbohydrate drink in your mouth, certain areas of your brain light up. So your brain is aware that there's carbohydrate in your mouth. And it's not a, it's not a placebo or a, 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 you know, a sweetness effect because it doesn't work with artificially sweetened drinks. It does work with tasteless carbohydrates. So your brain is aware that there's carbohydrate in your mouth. There's no fuel getting to your muscles. So there's no change in uh, you know, how hard your muscles have to contract or how much fuel they have. Um, and yet somehow it enhances performance, which suggests that uh, in the normal course of events, you're, you're, you're holding back some reserve that you're only able to access if you essentially trick your brain into thinking that there's, there's carbohydrate uh, or there's more fuel on the way that, um, without actually changing the amount of fuel. There's also there's a whole body of literature using deception. These studies are, tend to be pretty amusing. Um, and uh, there's been some work presented uh, uh, you know, over the last few days using, for instance, you're racing against uh, an, an avatar, uh, a virtual reality avatar that represents what you think is your performance, but the, the speed is actually manipulated. So you're racing against someone who's actually 1% faster than you think. Or there's clocks that run fast or slow, 
uh, misleading distance feedback, or you can even uh, you can even mislead about temperature, uh, changing the the room the room thermometer or actually the rectal thermometer also to mislead you into thinking about how hot the room is or how hot you are, and that can enhance performance in in hot conditions. So, you know, this whole body of research and the, and the things I was talking about before they they all point to this idea that the brain is maybe uh, cautious and holding something. The brain or you are somehow holding something in reserve whether you want to or not. Um, but they treat the brain as a black box. So what's, what's exciting in the last few years is the, the, the beginning of attempts to look inside the black box and say, OK, if there, is there a central governor? Is it, is it like, like Sam says, is there a little man in there who's pulling levers and saying, OK, now you can go fast? Or is there some, some other way that the brain is, is, is operating? So one, one attempt to, one, one of the sort of initial attempts to look inside and try and find where this central governor is uh, came from Kai Lutz at, the, at ETH Zurich. And there are a number of different ways of, of trying to look inside the brain, uh, and they, they all have different pros and cons. None of them are, are perfect at this point, particularly for during exercise. Um, what Kai chose to use is, is uh, EEG, so looking at the electro electrical activity in the brain in cyclists during a, a time to exhaustion test. And just this, this was a, sort of an early early attempt to figure out what's going on when you're riding at a at a, at a, a relatively hard intensity to the point where you reach volitional exhaustion. And so he sees activity key activity in a couple of areas. Um, one is the motor cortex, which is essentially the area that's t telling your muscles to contract. And I should I should uh, emphasize here that. Uh, this is a cartoon, not a not a sort of atlas of neuroanatomy. The the brain is very complicated, so this is just a, a sort of uh, an attempt to 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 convey some concepts. And, and similarly, when I talk, when I say you know this area of the brain does that, that's that's inevitably uh, a, a massive simplification. So so take it in the spirit it's intended, which is which is uh, you know uh, just to, to give a sense of, of maybe what's going on or, or what we think is going on. So there's the motor cortex, which is obviously uh, lighting up. And then there's the insular cortex, which is an area that, among other things, is responsible for interoception, which is the, it's, it's sensitive to signals from uh, uh, elsewhere in the body, like uh, hunger and thirst, hot and cold, discomfort, breathlessness, all these things uh, pass through the insular cortex. And so it makes sense that you'd see activity in these areas during hard exercise or exhaustive exercise. Uh, and and what, uh, what Kai and his graduate student, uh, Leah Hilti, found is that shortly before the moment of exhaustion, and it's the timing that's key here, before the cyclists reach the point where they had to quit, there's a, a burst of, act of uh, an increase in communication between the insular cor cortex and the motor cortex. And, and so it's the order of events, again, is, is what's key here, that it's not that uh, your muscles reach the point of failure, and then the brain responds and says, OK, now we need to stop. It's you're cycling along, and the, the area of the brain that's responsible for monitoring what's going on uh, at a certain point sends some uh, information to the area that's responsible for driving the, the muscles, and then the muscles stop. Then, then you, you step off the bike. So again, this is a simplification. And, and to the, if at some point in the, in the not too far future we have a more complete understanding of what's going on in the brain uh, during endurance exercise, I'm sure it's going to be way more complicated than this. But I think it's an interesting uh, sort of step in the, in the direction of, of at least asking the right questions of, of what is it that's happening when you make this when you when you either make this decision or or feel this decision imposed on you that you need to stop or slow down. So okay, the next thing I want to talk about is um, very briefly the, the lactate myth. And again, in this audience, probably the answers would be different. But if if I go and if I'm talking to a group of runners, just average runners, and you, you ask them, you know, why did you, why why did you have to stop at the end of the or you know why couldn't you Finish with that other runner, or how do you feel after your workout? A lot of the answers have to do with lactic acid. That you know, I, my legs were just burning from the lactic acid. I couldn't lift them. Um, and of course, the the science around this has has evolved and changed quite a bit. Uh, and the public understanding is is changing too. But there's been some interesting research just recently. Um, there was a study published last year from uh, Marcus Aman and Alan Light at the University of, of Utah. And they so. If, if lactic, well, if lactate, which is what is actually found in your in, in your muscles, is the cause of fatigue, then you should be able to inject lactate and, and sort of create the feeling of have, just having finished a hard interval workout. And if you do that, uh, it doesn't you don't get that feeling. It does not 
uh, reproduce the, the unpleasant feeling of, of, of exercise. And you can try, so they did this with, with volunteers sitting in a chair, just injecting into their thumb. So they're not even moving. They're just trying to reproduce, purely using metabolites, reproduce uh, the feeling of, of hard exercise. So lactate didn't work, so they tried some other metabolites. Protons don't work, even though they change the this is hydrogen ions, changes, changes the acidity of the, of the muscle. ATP, which also you see a, a rise in ATP uh, you know, during hard exercise, that doesn't work. If you inject two of these at a time, that doesn't work. But if you inject all three, all of a sudden you have the feeling of hard exercise. And if you, as you, if you inject, if you increase the quantity in, in sort of physiological amounts, then you get increasingly intense exercise associated pain in your thumb while just sitting in the easy chair not moving. So, so this is pretty neat and, and it's, it kind of suggests that independent of what may be happening in your muscle, you can, you can generate the feeling of exercise associated pain or discomfort uh, just, just by triggering these signals. And so that, this is a sensation that's in your brain. So it raises an obvious question, what, you know, what happens if you block the feedback so that you don't get that, uh, that signal? Can, if, if you're not feeling the discomfort or if you, if you, let's say, you are so tough you can just ignore that feeling of pain, can you just theoretically cycle on forever without, without any trouble? So that's, that's the sort of model that, that Aman and his colleagues have been exp uh, studying over the last few years. They've been injecting their subjects with uh, a nerve block called fentanyl, which is it's, it's essentially like uh, what women receive during, during childbirth. It's an injection into the spine. Uh, the signals from the brain to the muscles are, are unaffected, so you can still cycle or, or, or do whatever you want. Some of the feedback from the muscles to the brain is blocked. So for example, you will not feel this, the, the, if you inject these three metabolites below the, the, the nerve block, you won't feel this, this burning in your, in, your, uh, in your muscle. So if you ask subjects who've received a, a nerve block, this is kind of the dream for endurance athletes, right? You can pedal as hard as you want, and you're, you're going to feel no pain. So this should be wonderful. And, and sure enough, if, if, you, if, you, if you give this to people, ask them to run a 5K time trial, or, or cycle a 5K time trial, rather, uh, at the start, they feel like a million bucks, and they're, they're cycling at a million miles an hour. Uh, the, the horizontal lines there are the control and the, uh, and the, the sham group. And then the, the, the non-horizontal line is what happens if you have the nerve block. And as, as uh, as Lex said when he, when he showed this graph uh, yesterday, there's a lot going on in this graph. So it, it's, uh, there's a lot of physiology that happens when, when you block the afferent feedback. But the point is they start fast, they're feeling great, and then they, they can't maintain that pace. They start getting slower and slower as, as time progresses. They're still not feeling any pain. They're not, they're not slowing down because they're, they, they feel the lactic burn. Uh, they're slowing down because they're not sure why they're slowing down, but their legs just aren't going as fast as they want them to go. And by the end, they're, they're in a world of hurt. They're, they're experiencing levels of fatigue that they have never encountered before. So the first time they ran this experiment, the first guy finished the 5K time trial, uh, got off the bike, and, and immediately face planted on the floor. His, his legs didn't work. And so they, from then on, they had to make sure to you know, help the people off the bike. Some guys couldn't, couldn't get their, a lot of people couldn't get their feet out of the clips uh, on, on the pedals, and nobody could walk. Because they, they had levels of muscular fatigue that normally the brain would not permit them to reach. So th um, the main point I want to make here is that there are physical limits. There is, there is muscle fatigue, and, and blocking the feedback to the brain isn't necessarily an advantage, that, that in some sense the, the feedback may be something that helps you pace yourself appropriately to avoid crashing into those actual uh, muscular limits. So the next, the next part I want to talk about is some research that uh, our host, uh, Sam Marcora, has, has been developing. It's kind of walking into a minefield to try and present a simplified version of the ideas of someone who's sitting in the front row. So I'm sure Sam will leap up and, and throttle me if I get it wrong. But the, the, the basic idea here, to my understanding, what Sam would say is that in the context of endurance exercise, exhaustion is task disengagement rather than task failure. So if you're sitting against the wall <laughs> with no chair for as long as you can, when you collapse, it's not that there was some failure within your body. It's that essentially you chose that it's time for me to collapse onto the floor. 
and and you make that choice depending on the balance between perceived exertion essentially how how hard am i having to work to stay up against the wall balanced against potential motivation which is how hard am i willing to work to keep doing this within the context of my belief that it's possible for me to keep doing this and so this sort of shift in thinking the, the, the implication is an, or another way of looking at it <coughs> is so the intuitive understanding that that i grew up with and i think a lot of people would would, would have is that during a during a bout of intense exercise you have m muscle fatigue your, your muscles are getting tired and that makes you feel tired so you have the the perceived the, the feeling of perceived exertion and eventually it also forces you to slow down or stop your muscles are tired and that leads to both these these outcomes and instead sam would say that the muscle fatigue contributes to the feeling of perceived exertion and that in turn is what feeds into your eventual decision to slow down or stop uh, you know in combination with your level of motivation and the reason that's important is because it suggests that there are other things you can do to manipulate perceived exertion that have nothing to do with your body so without changing the the the, the fatigability of your muscles or the level of fatigue in your muscles you can manipulate perceived exertion which in turn will will affect your your endurance performance and sam went through some of these ideas this morning or all of them in fact i think um <laughs> that <laughs> so subliminal messages you can you can if you have cyclists cycle you know cycling to exhaustion he flashed happy faces or sad faces 16 milliseconds at a time so it's, you know totally uh, they were totally unaware of this manipulation and the ones who saw who who are who perceived without seeing the happy faces were able to cycle longer before reaching exhaustion. Uh, similarly, with encouraging words versus words associated with with fatigue. So subliminal messages, and and, the, and, and this effect was mediated by a change in perceived exertion. Same with self-talk. Now, self-talk is a a very standard, probably the most standard, uh, sports psychology intervention. Um, and, but what Sam has tried to do is quantify the the effect and and understand how it works. And so again, he, what he saw is that it it mediates, you know, positive self-talk lowers your perceived exertion for the same actual physical output, and that then leads to an increase in performance. Caffeine has all sorts of different effects uh, on the muscles, on, on metabolism in the brain, uh, but is it possible that the, the relevant effect in terms of endurance performance is that it changes your, your sense of perceived exertion, possibly by uh, blocking it, uh, certain neurotransmitters in the brain? Mental fatigue. If you pay very close attention to a long lecture on a Friday afternoon, by the end of the, that lecture, you may be very mentally fatigued, and you'll perform worse in, a, in an endurance task. Um, and, and Sam showed that in a version of that in, in, in 2009. And the flip side of mental fatigue is if mental fatigue makes things worse, then if you can find some way of reducing mental fatigue, for instance, if you can train your brain to be more resistant to mental fatigue, uh, you should be able to uh, reduce perceived exertion and improve performance. So this is the idea of the brain endurance trading. Uh, I heard Sam talking about it, I guess, five years now at a conference in Australia. Uh, and I thought that was a, a really surprising idea and a really interesting possibility. And so, I mean, the idea here is, you know, how do you train mental endurance? Essentially, it's just the same, the same way you would train physical endurance. If you wanted to improve your physical endurance, you would do something that made you physically fatigued, then you would take a break, recover, and repeat it. And you'd do that over and over again. And eventually your body would adapt to become more resistant to, to physical uh, fatigue. So the idea is the same in, in, in mental endurance or brain endurance. You do something that makes you mentally tired. So for example, you sit at a computer and you uh, arrows flash on the screen and you press a button that corresponds to the direction of the uh, middle arrow. So this is sort of you know, first grade level difficulty. It's very easy but you're supposed to do it as quickly as possible, and you're supposed to focus on it for whatever, 60 minutes, 90 minutes. Um, you're very mentally fatigued because it demands a lot of focus by, by the end. And if you do that on a regular basis, uh, maybe something happens in your brain. Um, in a sense, it's not really important what happens that makes you more resistant to mental fatigue as long as it works. Uh, it may, maybe the, the, the sensitivity of your brain to, to neurotransmitters like adenosine changes because you've flooded the brain with these neurotransmitters uh, on a daily basis. But the, the, the question is more, at this point at least, is, is does it work? So I'm a journalist, so when I heard, after I heard this idea, I, I talked to my editors at Runner's World and said, this sounds like fun, why don't, why don't, we give, why don't I go give it a try? So I, I, as, as Sam said, I came and visited 
the, the lab here for a little brain endurance training boot camp, I had Walter and Sam show me the, the basics of how all this works. And with Sam's help, I drew up a, uh, a brain endurance training program for the Ottawa Marathon. So for 12 weeks, five days a week, uh, I started with sessions of five minutes because it's surprisingly boring and hard and, and built up to 80 minutes by the end. And did some of, sometimes I just did brain training on its own. Sometimes I did combo sessions where I would do a, uh, a session of brain training and then I would head straight out and try and do a tempo run, which was a really kind of interesting sensation, the feeling of, of you know, feeling fine and yet being puzzled that I missed my splits again. I don't understand. Um, so I did that for 12 weeks and then I, and then I ran the race. And since this, this was an article for, for Runner's World, you know, my, the first question from my editors was, um, so did it work? Uh, and my answer was, I, I have no idea. I don't know. This is my this is my first marathon, and even if it wasn't, I have no control group. I, you know, there's so many variables in a marathon. So and it, and you know, they said, yeah, okay, but but does it work? Uh, so so here's here's how how it went for me. And this for those of you who went to, to Lex Major's talk yesterday, it will uh, it will look somewhat familiar because uh, my my marathon was pretty similar to his. Um, I maintained a pretty steady pace for for the first 30k, uh, one pee break aside. Uh, and then the wheels fell off. And for the purposes of, of, of this talk, why they fell off doesn't really matter. Personally, uh, I would attribute it to uh, eccentric muscle damage. My, I, I felt absolutely fine, except that my quads felt like someone, someone was you know, ramming a red-hot poker through them with every uh, foot, uh, foot strike. So that's an interesting discussion that, that, uh, of what causes people to hit the wall. But I have no idea whether brain training made that better or worse or, or nothing at all. So from my perspective, the real results are, first of all, that it was really exceptionally boring. I, I can't overstate how boring it was. And that meant that it was actually really difficult for me by the end of the 12 weeks to force myself to sit in that chair and do these stupid brain training games. I was doing the, the, you know, the, the arrows, and there's one with letters that flashes and another one with shapes and stuff. And it, it's just it's exceptionally boring. It's, it's also time consuming. You know, I, I have a, a job and a, a wife, and, and finding time to do marathon training is already a challenge. Uh, finding time to then add 30 to 60 minutes five days a week is, is actually a, a, a really big challenge. And what, what compounds that is that the third point is it's a big leap of faith. And there's certainly been, there have certainly been times in my life where I would do just about anything to get faster, no matter how unpleasant, no matter how time consuming. But, but the, the sort of that's predicated on the idea that I, I have a reason to believe that it's going to help. And, and in this case, you sort of wonder, especially after you've been pressing buttons for a while, you know, is this really, can this have any connection to marathon running? Or am I just doing this because some crazy Italian guy oh, has had some harebrained idea? So, so maybe. yeah, yeah, so, well, yeah, who knows? Maybe if, if Sam had given me the subliminal messages during the brain training, then maybe I wouldn't have blown up in the last 10K. But, um, Anyway, since, since I did that, the, there have been developments that, that in some ways address the second and third points at least. The first point, maybe nothing we can do about. But um, some results that, that uh, Walter and Sam presented at uh, the ACSM conference uh, this, this summer or this spring looked at co combining the brain training and the physical training. So the subject in this study uh, were sitting on a bike tapping, uh, you know, doing their, their brain training games at the same time. So that kind of kills two birds with one stone and takes care of the, the, the time management problem. And this was a randomized controlled trial, 12 weeks, three times a week. Um, obviously, there's problems with, with placebo control, and uh, uh, you can't blind a study like this. But the, the control group was doing the same physical training, the same bike training, but not no, no brain training. And so not surprisingly, the, uh, or as expected, both groups saw an increase in VO2 max. So oh, there's some funny formatting there. Oh, well. Um, so as you'd expect, they both got fitter to the same amount. But if you look at an actual measure of endurance performance, so a, a time to exhaustion trial, um, the, the brain training group had much greater improvements, uh, much larger improvements than the, uh, than the group that was just doing physical training. So, you know, there's there's clearly lots of caveats here in terms of the need to have it repeated by, uh, in, you know, in other formats with other people, with by other groups. Uh, does, would it work for uh, a well-trained, you know, elite athletes or well-trained athletes whose uh, ability to resist mental fatigue may already be close to the ceiling? Uh, th these are all all important questions. But certainly, this result gives me, uh, or, or makes me think that 
there's, there's, there's certainly reason to think that this mental fatigue is a variable that we may want to try manipulating in training, that's something, and it's something new. It's something that I don't think people have consciously been manipulating before. So whether it's in the format of brain training or in some other format, uh, and I know Sam has other ideas in terms of things like sleep deprivation to manipulate <coughs> mental fatigue, but it's, uh, these are encouraging results, I guess, is, is, is the, the conclusion from my perspective. Okay, so then the next area that I want to talk about, is, it's a little bit the opposite. So I've just been talking about how do you take a brain and make it more functional or more elite in the context of performance. But the, another way you can approach this is to take a bunch of people who are already very high performers, stick them in a brain scanner, and ask how are they different from the rest of us? What are, what are the brain patterns that distinguish elite performers from, from everybody else? So Martin Pallas, uh, he, he has a number of affiliations, wears many hats, but the two relevant ones in this case are that he's a, he's a psychiatrist and a neuroscientist at UC San Diego. And, and he also has collaborat collaborations with the US Navy through the Naval Health Research Center and, uh, and a number of other organizations. So San Diego is where the Navy SEALs train, uh, where US Marines train, and a number of, and a number of other special forces uh, groups. So he has access to a group of people who are notoriously tough, both phys physically and mentally. And he's done a number of studies with them. And also, with, with, he started to do studies with some elite athletes, some elite adventure racers. And he's currently uh, doing some studies with, with swimmers, uh, a group of elite swimmers who I, I believe are all Olympic medalists. So it's uh, you know, a really rare cohort. Um, and what he is, is finding is that elite athletes, compared to control subjects, show attenuated insular cortex act activation during an aversive interoceptive challenge. So just the first thing to point out is the insular cortex is, is the area of the brain that also showed up in, in Kai Lutz's uh, work at, at ETH Zurich. And this aversive interoceptive challenge, interoception again is, is monitoring signals from the rest of the body, awareness of, of uh, whether you're hot or cold or hungry. And in this, so he uses uh, fMRI to study, to look inside the brain. So the subjects are lying in the, in, in the bore of a magnet they're doing a cognitive challenge or a cognitive test that's very similar to the kinds of tests that, that Sam uses to induce mental fatigue. And they're breathing through a tube. And every once in a while, the flow of oxygen through this tube is constricted. So all of a sudden, they're, they can, they're, they're not going to pass out. They can get enough oxygen, but it's highly unpleasant, especially in the context of being you know, in the middle of an MRI magnet while, while trying to you know, place space invaders. So it's, it's, um, it's unpleasant. And the way. And you know some people do have panic attacks and have to come out of the, the MRI. But the, the, what you tend to see in normal people is that, or you know the, in the control groups, is that you know they're lying in there in the magnet play, doing the cognitive task. There's no particular uh, act, activity in their in their uh, insular cortex, and then and the, the the timing of the breathing restriction is not known. So you, you know that it might happen at any point, but you don't know what, exactly when it's going to happen. So when the breathing restriction flicks on, all of a sudden you see a spike in insular corte cortex activity as these people are sort of monitoring all their, their taking, taking note of uh, a distressing uh, signal in the, from their bodies. And, and that signal st it stays very high right after, uh, even after the breathing returns to normal. And you see a very different pattern in the elite athletes. Uh, <coughs> when, they're in, when they're in the state of, uh, not being breathing restricted, but knowing that it could happen at any time, they already have some elevated activity in the insular cortex. In a sense, they're they're uh, they're they're displaying some vigilance to be ready for the the, the interoceptive or the, the aversive challenge. So then, when when the breathing restriction actually starts, you see their activation go almost goes down to zero, as if they're they have prepared for it, they're ready for it, and it's no longer catching them by surprise. And what's impressive is that their performance on the cognitive task actually improves when they're, while their breathing is restricted. They make fewer errors. So they're in a sort of state of heightened vigilance. And then when the, you know, the, once the breathing uh, goes back to normal, you do see a little bit more activity as they take stock of things. And I don't want to overinterpret what these bars mean in terms of activity in the insular cortex. It's not like, again, it's, it's not like we know exactly what is happening when uh, the insular cortex lights up. But what's important is that there's a very distinct and different pattern between the control groups and the, the elite athletes. And, and, it's, and it's now this paradigm has now been tested on a bunch of different groups of elite performers. So that being the case, you can, you can wonder, is there anything we can do to create this pattern? Do you have to be born with it, or is it just through years of training? Or can you kind of train your brain to uh, 
be more like uh, the elite athletes. And, and I, I guess just be before moving on, I should also say, lying in a tube, breath, uh, you know, breathing through a pipe and, and playing games it, it is obviously a, quite a big leap from running a race. But I do think, you know, if you squint a little bit, you can see some parallels between the challenges that faced by endurance athletes. That, for instance, preparing for a, you know, a surge from a competitor who, and you don't know when the surge is going to happen, you don't know how long it's going to happen. You have to be prepared for unpleasantness, and then you have to react optimally when it happens without panicking, without being caught by surprise. So I, I think you can see some parallels, maybe. Or I can see some parallels. So anyway, in terms of, uh, in terms of creating this pattern, the, the paradigm they've been working with is, is mindfulness-based stress reduction. Now, this is a, a, a bit of a buzzword these days. It's, there's a lot of research going on and a lot of hype, but it's basically a, a, a sort of pseudo-Buddhist kind of Thing where you work on breathing exercises and uh, uh, you know yoga, meditation skills, and things like that. The standard sort of course that people use is an eight-week-long course that includes about 20 hours of of, of instruction. Um, and so they've been trying it out, as I said, on on special forces. They've and they've now done this with hundreds of of uh, U.S. Marines preparing for deployment in, in places like Afghanistan. And a subset they put a subset of these Marines through the the uh, brain scanning aversive challenge b before and after uh, the mindfulness. And, and what they find is that those who've been through mindfulness, because they, they, they do have control groups to display a more elite active, you know, quote unquote elite activation pattern in their insular cortex. And some of these changes persist even a year later in follow up. Um, and so, uh, you know, they've also just last week they published. Uh, a pilot study where they they'd modified the standard mindfulness course for uh, to be specialized especially for athletes. So they did a pilot study with seven members of the U.S. BMX cycling team. Uh, and again, same thing with when they put them through the brain scanner, they ended up seeing a more uh, you know a, a quote unquote better pattern of, of brain activity activity in response to the um, to the breathing challenge. Um, as a pilot study, they also collected, you know, there's no control group, but they collected quanti or qualitative measures. So the athletes reported being, you know, more focused in competition, more ready to, to, to do their best. And in terms of, you know, anecdotal outcomes, they, the athletes in the pilot study did sweep the, the medals at the U.S. Uh, BMX championships last year. Okay, so the last, the last area I want to talk about is electric brain stimulation. Um, Specifically, what, I, what I'm talking about here is, is a technique called transcranial direct current stimulation, or TDCS. And this is a very, very simple, actually sort of disturbingly simple kind of brain stimulation. You can take a, a current source, basically like a 9-volt battery, hook up two electrodes uh, to it, and put them on your head. And, and, and you, know, you, can, you can look up on, on YouTube how to do this, and there's a big DIY community out there, which is quite scary. Um, but yeah, you, you do that, and you'll be running a weak current through your brain. And the areas where the current passes through, you'll be changing the, the excitability of the neurons. So depending on the direction of the current, you'll be actually you'll be making them a little bit easier to fire or a little bit harder to fire. And you can put the electrons pretty much wherever you want, and you know the placement of the electrodes determines which regions of the brain the uh, the current will be flowing through. So you can get different effects depending on where you place the, the currents or the place the electrodes. So Lex uh, Lex Major and his colleagues here published a study earlier this year where they, uh, where they applied TDCS to the motor cortex, which also, it's a sort of blunt instrument. So you hit many different areas of the brain. So it, it, you hit some adjacent areas which are involved in pain processing. So they showed that if you, if you give people TDCS and then have them plunge their hand into an ice bucket for as long as they can, which, which is a very standard uh, pain test, uh, their perception of pain is, is lower. But if you, if you give them TDCS and then have them do a ride to exhaustion on a bike, that doesn't actually change their perception of the exercise-associated pain, and so it doesn't change their their uh, performance either. So, you know, uh, there was a whole session on on the role of pain in exercise, and this is a, a an interesting debate. Um, I think what's interesting here is that you can start to you can see how using things like brain stimulation gives you a way of exploring the role of pain without changing other parameters. So, you know. Lex has shown that if you give someone paracetamol, the, the, their endurance performance will improve. But you don't know whether that could be also associated with the fact that paracetamol might uh, keep your core temperature lower. It's, it's an antipyretic. Or, or, or if it, change, you know, it may be changing the excitability, 
corticospinal excitability or something. So TTCS allows you to just start playing with the brain and, and, and tweak some of these parameters. But in this case, no, uh, no performance boost. But there was a study uh, from Brazil that was published in, in 2013 where they used a different electrode placement. So instead of putting the electrode on the, above the motor cortex, they targeted the temporal and insular cortex. So it's the insular cortex uh, popping up again here. And in this case, they did find that uh, if you gave TDCS just before uh, uh, a performance test, uh, perceived exertion was lower right from the very start of the, of the progressive test. And as a result, performance was higher. They were able to reach about 4% higher uh, peak power output in this progressive test. So this is, uh, you know, it's a little bit scary and it's also a little bit cool. And it, 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 it got a lot of attention from, from people in the sports world. So, for example, last year, Red Bull brought together four of its elite athletes. So they were actually cyclists and triathletes. And they brought together 30 scientists uh, from, from around the world and to do five days of testing at, at the, their headquarters in California, and, and you know, both in the lab and also at a, at a, at a velodrome. And they had TDCS, they had transcranial magnetic stimulation, EEG, EMG, peripheral nerve stimulation. They were doing the whole battery of things on these elite athletes who were doing test after test, you know, 4K time trial after 4K time trial to exhaustion, um, trying to figure out where along that chain from the brain to the muscle the, 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 you know, the, the limiting factors seem to, seem to crop up. Now, I haven't seen any results from this. This is, this is a picture of me getting, getting some TDCS while taking notes in the name of, of journalism. Um, I survived, but um, yeah, there's, I haven't seen any results from this, and I, I wouldn't really expect to see any particular results. I think this was, you know, with four subjects, you're not going to really see much. But I think what it what it indicates is that um, the research that I've been talking about, these ideas, uh, I think that you know a lot of the research is motivated by the idea of let's try to understand what's going on with endurance performance. Let's understand the role of the brain. But the sports world is definitely paying close attention, and everything that's being done is being watched and, and is being tried. And long before it reaches the level of being proved, anything that even looks hopeful is going to be there are going to be athletes uh, trying it out. So for me, in terms of TDCS, the questions that, that remain open: first of all, does it work? I mean, that's obviously very much open. I think can you use it to, to enhance performance repeatedly? Um, is it safe? There, there's no indication that it's not safe, but when you start talking about, if you start, when you start thinking about people using it on a regular basis, you know, day after day, and if you start thinking about younger athletes whose brains are still developing, there's, I, I would certainly be a little cautious about that. And finally, is it cheating? Um, and I, this is again a question that's come up in other talks too, when talking about ways of enhancing performance. Is I, if I was competing, I'm, I'm not sure I'd really relish the idea that I that I should be running electro, uh, you know, electricity through my brain before a competition to get an edge. But it's, it's hard to think about how you would test for something like this. Uh, and, so, and so anyway, it becomes one of those sticky questions of how do we regulate this? How do we, what, what's our vision of, of the role of technology in sport? Um, but these questions have to be addressed because I think the research is marching on and I think we're going to see a lot more uh, uh, research, whether it's subliminal messages or whether it's you know, a shock to the brain. Uh, we're, we're finding that there are ways of, of enhancing performances uh, without touching the muscles. So just to, to, to go back to where I started with this uh, sitting against the wall test, I guess the one conclusion I can draw from this, I don't know exactly, I don't know what's happening, but it, it seems clear to me that this, this, this line here of, of supposed limits is not, is not etched in stone. It's, it's pretty clear that what's going on in your brain can, can push those limits up or can push them back. And, and, and my impression is that athletes and coaches actually don't spend a lot of time thinking about this. And, and um, even not even with the advanced stuff, but just the basic ways that, um, you know, the, the subliminal cues that you may pick up from a coach or from your surroundings or, or from emotional suppression before a race, I think these are, these are, these are greatly neglected by, by athletes. So from a practical sense, that's interesting. And from a, you know, I think we're, we're, we're seeing that there isn't just one answer for how the brain affects performance. There's a, there's a whole kitchen sink, and I think it's going to be pretty uh, exciting over the next few years as, as we continue to see what all the different things that uh, that we can use to to, um, to manipulate the brain. So that's it. That's I, I do want to thank all the all the scientists who've, who've given me their time and who've let me hang around their labs and and uh, and hear about their research. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to hear comments and questions. Thank you.